meeting the order you can. Good evening, everyone. Is, is anyone else having audio problems? Uh oh. No? Okay, I'm going to leave and come back then. I guess we can rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Hang up, have a moment. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Hey, Robert, I'm unable to bring up, for some reason, I'm unable to bring up my agenda. The file is just not, oh, thank you so much. Let me see here. I just need to scroll it a little bit. Okay, so roll. Uh, Vice Chair Collins. I think you're muted. Here. Uh, Christine David. Here. Uh, Joe Davis is not here. Sri Ram um, here. Jerome is here, and Tom was, I think he said he was rejoining. Tom, are you on? I'm here, still having audio problems, so. Okay. We can hear you loud and clear, Tom. Okay, great. I may, I, I'm getting a weird reverb feedback from the other end, so I may just dial in, see if that helps. So uh, do we have any member of the public? Uh, do we have any public comments? I didn't receive any, Chief. Did you receive any public comments? No, I did not. Okay. Moving on to approval of the minutes, uh, the previous meeting. Uh, since I wasn't there, I'm not sure. Carol? Uh, I am fine with the minutes as written and would um, propose they're accepted as written. So we, if you propose, I can second. Okay. Um, I know we could do a, a roll call. I know, Suram, you're going to abstain from it because you're not, you weren't here. Uh, Tom? I think I heard my name. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. Um, do you vote the affirmative on approval of the minutes? Give me one sec, I'll dial in here. Okay, I'll jump to Christine. I wasn't at the last meeting, so I don't know if I could vote on this. Okay, so I think we're going to have to put, if we don't have uh, enough people to vote on it, I think we're going to have to push it off. So if I, if I could interject. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, um, I think it's perfectly acceptable for you to vote in the affirmative or negative if you find that you, you are not comfortable with the um, minutes. Uh, if you've read the minutes and they seem reasonable to you, even though you weren't at the uh, previous meeting, uh, it's perfectly okay for you to uh, vote to uh, accept the reading of the minutes. I've read the minutes and I'm... Uh, I can vote to second it. Yes, thank you, Sean. And Christine? Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. I've read them. Good, okay, thank you. Okay. Carol? Yes. Yeah, you did, okay, great. So I think that's everybody. So since we do not have any old business, uh, moving on to speed feedback signs. Yeah, so I will Robert. introduce it. We do have a member of the BPAC um, here with us tonight to uh, provide a little more background as to the discussion that the uh, BPAC had um, on the couple of items on today's agenda. So on the speed feedback signs, um, as is typical, the BPAC committee takes a look at our uh, bicycle pedestrian um, facilities and uh, occasionally makes recommendations with regards to the installation of new speed feedback signs. We do get a limited budget every year or have been getting a limited budget every year to help facilitate the installations. Um, we have, as you know, um, a host of signs that we will be putting in this fiscal year and the uh, review and approval of these things will um, help us 
in um, proposing installations related to the upcoming capital budget. So uh, what we have are recommendations to install signs on Fair Oaks Lane, Oak Grove near Madrone and on Selby. Um, and so with that, um, I'll introduce um, Steve Bailoff from the BPAC and you can speak to it a little more. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I'm relatively new to BPAC this year, but uh, I can give you a little bit of the history. We did go through an analysis of the traffic incidents over the last uh, period of time, looked at the existing infrastructure, where are the current existing signs, and then prioritize them. This is the result of uh, a couple of those deliberations. Um, I'm, I can try to answer questions if you have specifics, but um, this, I think, kind of lays it out pretty clearly. And uh, we also tried to live within um, sort of budgetary constraints as we understand them. Are these temporary uh, and portable feedback signs or permanent? That's not the intent. It's to, I think the idea is to put in permanent signs that have, um, you know, that tell people what their current speed is and hopefully also indicate the, uh, the uh, speed limit. Uh, the two together seem to be most effective. So it, they do need to be placed in um, situations where there's some um, overhead light, um, sunlight. Um, but you've, you know, I'm sure you've seen these around the, around the neighborhood. So this would be more of those, the more modern ones, um, which, which I guess are a little more expensive, allow us to record the, the history of uh, people's speed, which I think could be quite useful from traffic enforcement point of view. Um, and so what we did not do is really intend to replace any existing ones, rather we're filling in what we think are some of the hot spots that they don't have good coverage currently but we would also be using the more modern signs with this a storage capability. And so Strom, it'd be similar to the signs that are up now on Watkins. Right. Um, or even on James. Uh, James. Uh, the ones that, uh, yeah, the one, I know the one on Watkins has, has the ca capacities that um, Steve was talking about. I don't recall the one on, on James if it's the same, but it will have the, uh, it's similar to what we talked about last meeting on, well, you weren't there on Glenwood. And so it would have a speed limit sign. It would have the feedback sign that, you know, indicates the speed. It would uh, start flashing as people exceeded the, exceed the speed limit. And then uh, uh, after a certain number of miles an hour over the speed limit, uh, start flashing slow down. I'm curious, is the data that's collected just the speed limits of individuals passing by and it's a, it, it's, it's a, like a data point? Yeah, it, it collects the, it should be collecting the time and date and speed of vehicles. But not the, not the uh, license plates. No, it's just, it just detects something, something going by and annotates the speed. Are the uh, residents uh, the, uh, in the neighborhood, are they okay with this? Ha has there been a, um, uh, a citizens outreach done? Not as of yet. This is just the initial recommendation as to locations to potentially place these things. And typically what we would do is once we identify locations, we would start um, before we install, reach out to the fronting property owners of where we propose to place them to make sure that there's uh, not a, a significant objection and we can typically make adjustments, but the placement typically will rely as uh, Steve indicated um, on making sure that there's enough sunlight for the solar panel that, uh, that provides the power for it. I may through the chair. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I believe that this is kind of the first step uh, transportation committee members um, 
uh, recommend uh, this action uh, based on the recommendations of, the, I guess, the BPAC, and then it moves on up to City Council for uh, final deliberation and approval. And at that point, then the uh, public outreach is, is done. Is that correct, Robert? That's correct. Can I ask, wasn't um, public outreach somewhat done with that NTMAP, all that? that was uh, yes, goal. but these locations are different than what was done, what were recommended yes. in, the, in the other plan. And so I think these are okay. additional yes. signs that are being requested. So how, sorry, uh, Carol, you're done? Yeah, okay. So it, how important is the public response? If uh, they're against it, then would this plan still go forward? I, assuming uh, Transportation Committee approve, um, recommends it and uh, City Council approves it? Well, if there's an objection from the property that we outreach to in terms of placement, we would either try, we'd probably try and come up with a couple of potential locations to place the signs before conversing with the property owners. And really it's only the property owner that the sign is in that frontage strip that, um, that we do much outreach with because we're doing work along the frontage strip in front of their property. So we wanna make sure that if there's any significant concerns that we address them, but as with other safety improvements, we do have the right to place things within the public right of way. But we do wanna make sure that we are coordinating with the property owner. And if moving it a couple of feet this way or that way make, makes a difference to them, we're happy to do that. Thank you. If no one has any, I, I, Tom, Sorry. did you want to say something? I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, who's on mute? Tom. Tom. I'm sorry, Tom. We didn't get that. You're on mute. There you are. Yeah. I, okay. I guess this works. So I, I dialed it on the phone, which is not on mute. But anyway, the um, there's no personally identifiable data that's collected by these boxes, but they will do the same or similar job as the current black boxes today in terms of keeping track of speed, high and low, and all that. Uh, for the most part, the distinction really is the black box is something that's not really seen by motorists, um, whereas this, obviously, there may be a little bit of impact. Hopefully, with them seeing it, they do slow down. So you'll have right. a slight distinction between what speeds you would collect with a black box versus this sign. Gotcha. So there, there is a visual deterrent, obviously, but it's collecting the data that we can then trend back to when the black box was there, as well as you know, keeping track of trend data for speeds on on that road at that location. That's correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be interesting to look at and see the effectiveness of these signs. So, Robert, do we have any action for the committee on this? Any action item on this specific? Yeah, the, the action item would be to we wanted to recommend moving forward. Got it. Uh, I'm in favor of moving forward because um, I guess the people who are impacted are the ones who are um, who have already recommended this and they've done a, a fair amount of research. Um, I'd love to hear uh, from the rest of uh, my peers on this uh, committee. I guess I'd like to say it seems like I, I, we're supposed to join the two lists. Is that kind of what we're supposed to do? I mean, it seems like uh, Selby Lane is on both. Yeah, I think there, there are different 
stretches. And so I just oh. provided that for informational, okay. for, for your information that those were the next phase recommended in the NTMAP. But I think the budgets are gonna be separated. So we are okay with the additional recommendation to bring forward to the, to the council as part of the budget process. So Robert, we're recommending all of these signs or just, just the, the first, the first ones that came out of the BPAC, the first four. Gotcha. Okay. Seems very reasonable. First three, I can see three. Yeah. Okay. Four as in two radar signs plus the one each. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we can start off if there's a motion. I will move that we, um, we recommend I, the four locations. And I second. Okay, so I'll do a quick roll. Um, Carol? Yes. Uh, Christine? Aye. Tom? Yes. Suram? Yes. All right. So. If you want to move on, move on to the next item. Very lean, yeah. Okay, I'm happy to give a brief introduction on this one. Um, and then I will again turn it over to Steve and I'll bring up uh, a couple of uh, images that might help in the deliberation and discussion. Um, so at the last BPAC meeting, during their conversation on speed feedback signs, they were looking at the potential for putting one on Barry Lane. Um, with the, the narrow roadway width, uh, there was a bit of a concern, um, particularly around the, uh, the tight curves near um, Faxon, um, that as cars come down there to avoid pedestrians and cyclists, they occasionally veer into the oncoming lane. Um, and so there is a desire to consider some uh, potential warning signage, uh, basically to advise motorists of the potential of um, pedestrian and bicycle traffic um, on the roadway. And so with that, I will turn it over to Steve as I try and bring up a couple of images here. So on this topic, um... It was helpful to get the perspective of Sergeant Metzger, who was attending the last meeting, because he's he was able to comment on some of the, the hazards involved in this. I'm sure you guys have traveled over this. We're talking particularly around that stretch that goes over the creek where the road turns, and as you probably know, uh, it's it's quite you know, it's circuitous, but there's also not much margin on either side. Um, I've had a lot of experience here. My wife and I walk our dogs there regularly, and um, we witnessed. Um, what well, we witnessed accidents in addition to near accidents. As Sergeant Metzger pointed out, um, this is still a 25 mile an hour zone. I mean, I th there's a broader discussion around whether that's the right speed limit, but knowing that changing speed limits is a difficult thing to do. We had a, a, a larger discussion on, well, what else could be done there to mitigate the significant risks that we see there regularly. And in particular, I would say it's it's tending towards. Uh, I don't want to get too specific, but if you're if you're going uh, uh, southbound around school time, you know this is one of the cut throughs. This and Elena are the two cut throughs to uh, a lot of the schools on the other side. And there's a often a, a bright sun that hits you early in the morning going over that bridge. And it's um, it's a combination of factors, but I think you tend to see a lot of speeding, particularly in the, on the morning south commute side of things. Yeah, kind of going in that direction, I think. So one of the suggestions that came out of our discussion was, well, what, what can be done? And someone had brought up the idea of putting in one of these warning flashing signs, which is sort of a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, more, a more intrusive, if you will, sign that, that would warn people about the upcoming curve. Um, and, and remind them to slow down. Um, 
of all the suggestions on how to mitigate this risk, that was the one that seemed most palatable. I mean, speed bumps, frankly, would be probably the most effective, but I, that, I think a much more politically charged topic, um, I'm guessing. And in any case, the, um, the, the, the sign was what we came to as, as maybe a first step to try to get people to slow down and be more cautious as to make that turn and not do it at 25 miles an hour, because it's, it's really not safe. Um, so that's kind of the overview of it. And, you know, I, if, if any of you um, haven't been down that road and we can, I can spend more time on that, but I imagine most of you have. Um, and in particular, you can see here on the map, it turns, but it, as it goes over the hump, I mean, over the creek, it, there is, a, you know, a, a hill and people uh, have been known to take that quickly. I've witnessed people going fast enough that actually brought the, actually the car turned over on its side. We witnessed that a few years ago, a teenager going way too fast and flipped the car. So it's, it's a serious problem. And more so, I would say, than even Elena, which does have speeders um, cutting through, but there it's a straight shot. Here, because of the curve, it adds, a, I think, another element of danger, which is, um, I think, problematic. I'll stop there. I'm going to try and see if I can get. So I think this is the general area that you were talking about. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah, that's right. Um, before you get to the yeah, that's right. There's the you can see there. There's the um, the that creek and where it narrows. It turns at the same time, and uh, you know people walk. There's a lot of pedestrians. A lot of bicycle traffic there. So that's a pinch point and. And then you get the trucks coming across there too with all the construction. So it's it's ready for a serious problem. I mean, would not I mean a fatality there would would not surprise me to be honest. I think you got a lot of so sort of three major components. With um, I think that's a bike route, not the, not the designated one, but for most of the folks coming from West Selby, Paul Hamas that whole area of, you know, from Alameda West, that's going to be your first turn getting to Sacred Heart or even Menlo, right? Because you would come out on the right to Sacred Heart. It's a class three share. You, get the park, you know, you that, turn left and head to Menlo. That's exactly right. And that's why I think it gets heavy uh, school time traffic in the morning. Well, both, both ways, but in the morning, people seem to be in a bigger hurry. Yeah, well, and that's when the sun's going to be in your eyes. But the other thing is, you know, certainly in that May June time frame, there seemed to be all, just a tremendous amount of new drivers. I just noticed from my being on the roads and walks and whatnot. Um, and all sometimes my morning takes me up towards West Selby, and you know, you've got um, newer drivers, faster cars, um, and this is this road is you know, I could see where it would become dangerous. And then the regular traffic combined with construction traffic, and that has always been a pinch point because the hump. I'm not sure whether we're looking north or south on that, but there is a bit of a, of a hump there as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that hump with the turn, we've seen people get airborne there. Yeah, well, once that word gets out, I think you're gonna have folks coming to try to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could turn it into a skateboard park instead. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question, what, what would the sign say? Blind curve or slow down or what? Robert, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to try to? Well, I can bring up a couple of images of uh, some potential warning signs um, for consideration. Um, and so things that can be considered would be something like narrow bridge, um, you know, something about the curves or um, you know, watch for pedestrians and so I, I think Sergeant Mesker's suggestion initially was a flashing light. I mean, not something much more likely to get your attention, not a standard speed sign like these, but rather literally a flashing light that sort of says slow warning, you know, dangerous cross, something to that effect. So something active, I think, was his, was his suggestion. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of the type of beacons that are part of the... Um, MUTCD, there's a couple um, and things that can be done provided that there's enough 
sunlight. They actually, there is a, uh, there are a couple of manufacturers that in essence will take a skin line and put the LED um, lights in them. And so it'll be kind of flashing, but the concern is really going to be making sure that there's enough sunlight to power, to power it. Um, so that's one. Uh, we do have on Alameda de las Pulgas approaching Stockbridge um, with, uh, I think it is the, um, the W2-1, uh, this sign here that has uh, a little flashing yellow light on top. <clears throat> You know, one of the things for, for us uh, to do enforcement, which would be nice, is uh, it, it, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the S-turn on, on Atherton Avenue. When you go into the S-turn, there's a recommended speed of 20 miles an hour. And, you know, even though the speed limit through there is 25, on Barry, you know, cars going at 25 seem like they're, they're, they're flying through there. So if we could get, a, you know, recommended speed uh, for a portion of that roadway, to be 20 miles an hour then it gives us the ability to write a ticket at 30 miles per hour if the record you know if if, if, it, if the speed limit is 25 for the majority of the street but that area there uh if we you know a cautionary sign of 20 then we can issue a ticket for speeding at 30 miles an hour right now it's going to be really tough for us to go into court and you know write a speeding ticket for somebody going to, you know 28 29 miles an hour you know when the speed limit is 25 I think that's an excellent point. And by the way, I could, could not agree more. And when people are doing, even at 25, it feels like they're rocketing through there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's something that we can look at is a combination of the curve and the speed uh, speed warning sign as suggested by Sergeant Metzger. Yeah. Hey, so, um, my question is, have we done enforcement? And I guess that's for you, Sergeant Metzger. Um, what the enforcement's been like there, what we found? You know, uh, myself and, and one of the other uh, motorcycle officers will go out there and we'll, and we'll, and we'll be in the area and, and be seen. But again, it's going to be really difficult for us to, to make a, a traffic stop for somebody that, again, is, you know, only, you know, you know, four or five miles an hour above the posted speed limit. It's, it's, uh, right. it's difficult for us to, you know, justify a stop for that. But if we can get, you know, even though the speed limit's 25, if we can get a recommended speed of 20 miles an hour, then if we stop somebody for close to 30 or, or 30, then at least we're stopping them for 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And it may not even be, you know, the type of thing where we're going to go out and write a budget tickets, but at least we can right. make, make some stops, flag some people over, give some warning citations, and at least be seen actually doing enforcement in the area. Well, that, I mean, yeah. and I Word gets out that I mean, especially amongst the younger drivers, right? Then word gets out that the cops are hanging out there, yeah. and and that has the desired effect. I, I like some of the signs, but and and I don't believe that that behavior is based on lack of knowledge across the people that I think are probably doing most of the speeding through there. Um, but I think enforcement, and I agree with you um, that having a sign that that you know that make the temporary speed limit such that you can take action against it is, uh, is a good idea. Well, a combination would be very effective. And, and the, the advantage of if you could get a 20 mile an hour speed limit, you wouldn't have to worry so much about the, the signs wouldn't be as important. I think it's gonna be easy to find a, a place where there's sunlight on the southbound direction. The northbound, if it's closer to that, that facts and curve, it is very shaded. So I'm not sure there would be a spot there to put a sign if, if we were thinking of doing it in both directions. But but yeah, I love the idea of a 20 mile an hour uh, and combination with the sign. I think that would be quite effective. Right, if you a black a black and yellow 25 mile, 20 mile an hour cautionary sign. Because at least, you, you know, we could stop somebody and if they're going 30 miles an hour, they're gonna say, well, there's, you know, the speed limit is 25, I'm only five over. But if we could say, hey, there's a sign there that said, you know, that you should really be going 20 miles an hour through this section in Europe, but, you know, birds of 30. So, like um, the here that we're seeing on the screen, right? Right. Yeah, so this is on Atherton Avenue. Right. So, Steve, uh, you know, I'm sure you and BPAC have really discussed this and, you know, checked out all angles. And I don't think there's much we can come up with, but 
the, is there any way uh, practically possible to introduce some sort of a stop sign there? I know it's not an intersection, but well, you're asking the wrong guy. I would I would ask. I mean, the people who've been on this committee um, or, or or Sergeant Mesker, they they probably know better. To me, that's a much more likely to be a, a, a big fight with the with the locals. I think people really resist putting a stop sign on their street. I agree. I mean, actually, bumps, speed bumps are worse than stop signs. But well, I guess that's what I was saying. You guys have probably discussed this um, at great length, and I don't think there'd be probably any new ideas uh, that we could come up with out of that. Well, I mean, I think this is actually beyond our purview, you know, to be honest, I think it's more a transportation committee topic to be candid. I mean, um, maybe it affects us a little, you know, the BPAC, but we did not spend a lot of time on this to be candid. I think we sort of assumed that it, the, the, the political will was gonna be, it would be tough to put a stop sign in, um, but, you know, I would defer to you guys. You have more history here than I do. No, I agree with you, Steve. Uh, that's definitely a bigger challenge. But maybe we could potentially, I mean, since this is probably not going to cost much, um, Sergeant Metzger's idea of, uh, you know, the warning sign of the 20 miles per hour and then um, enforcement on top of that. And maybe even, um, I, I guess you must have already tried leaving the uh, cruiser there on random days and, you know, during the peak hours and stuff like that. Well, I don't remember seeing the cruiser on Barry. Um, I've seen it over towards Sacred Heart on Elena and so forth, but but yeah, I'm not sure how effective the cruiser, certainly not effective with the kids. They're pretty smart. Um, the, 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 issue, the issue with leaving the car on, on Barry is that one, there's not a lot of areas to even park it. And then once you do find an area with a shoulder to park it, now you've got the pedestrians walking on the roadway yeah. to yeah. walk away. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's pretty, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a hazard. I can tell you one thing we did talk about was the the, problem, the, the the feasibility of speed bumps. That was discussed in a couple of meetings ago and a long discussion around, you know, how does Menlo Park do it? And there's, you know, you have, obviously you have to care for the emergency vehicles and this and that. And we talked about it and I don't know that we made any progress and whether we thought that was even a feasible option. So this was, I think, kind of the first step to try to rectify the situation, probably a lot more palatable. Um, not as good, obviously, as speed bumps and probably not as good as a, as a stop sign either. Right, so we could potentially, yeah. Uh, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would love to um, propose that we recommend the um, 20 miles per hour warning sign um, added with um, buttressed with the enforcement um, and I'd like my committee members to uh, second it or. I'd be happy to second it. I think it's very reasonable to have anybody slow down at a curve to 20 miles an hour, I think is a great idea. And I'm assuming that a lot of the people that we wanna influence are more so high school students. And um, they, they're pretty good at spreading the word if, if uh, you know, a speed, an area is a, uh, an area where they could get a ticket. They're pretty good at talking about that. I agree with you, Christina. And <laughs> so would this, uh, in terms of uh, positioning the signs th at the right place, would this be something that BPAC would come up as a recommendation or would it be Robert and team that would? Uh, well, I think it? that the, what I would propose is that if you pr um, approve uh, or rec say if you, um, Recommend approve the installation of one of those curve signs along with that speed warning sign. We could work with Sergeant Metzger about figuring out where the best place to place it is. So, do, Robert, do you need to do a roll on this or with? Uh, uh, yeah, so I think I have. Um, can I, can I, a, go ahead. Thanks. Can I have um, just a a comment question before we vote. Um, it looks like there's the double yellow line through the whole curve there. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, there is. Which is surprising that people still don't, they don't stay on their side of the road. Because that was one of the early comments. People don't even stay on their side of the road. Oh, but that's, Carol, that's because there's always, 
dog walkers coming at them. So they have no choice but to swing over to avoid hitting the, the dog walkers, the pedestrians, the bicyclists. So they're kind of mm. forced into making a decision, which means crossing the yellow. In fact, in fact, if they don't cross the yellow line, it's, it's very dangerous for the pedestrians. Well, they can stop. But anyway, just yeah, but, curious. I wanted to make sure I, I, it's because that's one of the things when they do all the studies, they say, oh, double, you know, double yellow lines and this and that makes people behave better. I, just, mm. I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not I don't know all the reasons the roads, but this very lane has always seemed to be a very narrow road. And then the the crossing there over the creek is obviously yeah. a pinch point. Just the amount of, I don't know, foliage and, and whatnot that creeps up. Even in the image, Robert, you have on the screen, the rocks forward, you know, downrange on the road there, the little lamp next to the shrubbery on this one. I mean, it's, it just feels like a very narrow street. And I think to Sergeant Metzger's point, there, there isn't a good place to park the patrol car. And once you do, you take up what little space there is. So, I mean, looking at this image, if there's a bicyclist and we, you go the three feet route, you're definitely in the oncoming lane. Um, someone walking a dog at the end of a leash, I mean, yeah, I think whatever we can do to slow, slow folks down on, a, on what is otherwise a shortcut as I think quantity of traffic increases and we're getting into uh, new driver season as far as I could tell, this is good timing on a good idea. So Robert, would you like to go ahead with the roll? Uh, yeah, well, can I first get a motion? I'll so move. I think the move. Yeah. A second. All right. So, Carol? Yes. Uh, Christine? Yes. Tom? Yes. Sura? Yes. All right. All good. I guess now we move on to the staff reports. Yes. I'm hoping I have the agenda shared. You do? Yes. yes. Yeah. Sergeant Metzger, if you want to introduce this one. Sure. Um, well, the traffic statistics for the last two months are included. Um, are there any, uh, any questions about the numbers uh, for the last couple of months? I, I will indicate that one of our traffic officers uh, was well was actually fortunate enough to become a daddy again so he was out for the last month so we were down one traffic officer congratulations to the officer i have a question about the uh, pedestrian uh car interaction on green oats i um it was at oak grove or it was at like in front of 359 green oats i'm sorry Oh, I, I had a question about the uh, pedestrian um, that was hit by a car. Can you tell oh. us more? Yeah, that was a that was a younger driver, uh, I I believe, uh, but uh, an adult, but uh, but probably near the age of uh, eighteen. Uh, uh, a pedestrian was walking with some family members. I think there were four of them, and it was dark out. They were walking um, on the. Well, Green Oaks goes in a circle. So they were walking from Frederick towards Oak Grove on what would be essentially the west side of the, the roadway. So they were walking mm -hmm. facing traffic like they're supposed to. Yeah. And uh, a car was traveling from Oak Grove towards Frederick. And they're not, they're not necessarily under the impression that he was going too fast. I think uh, he came around the corner and was surprised to see some of the pedestrians there and just made a poor decision and, uh, and, and, and made a made a turn that didn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense, but just, you know, an inexperienced driver. I think part of it was the, uh, one of the pedestrians was carrying a flashlight and as cars go by, and I've seen this myself, pedestrians will, you know, kind of try to shine their flashlight at the drivers, but oftentimes they end up, you know, shining it in their eyes. And uh, the driver of the vehicle stated that, you know, that the flashlight that one of the pedestrians was carrying, you know, was, you know, was in his eyes. So may have been a little bit of a contributing factor. Yeah. Thank you. That's sorry to hear that. Sergeant, uh, to that, that very, minor, very minor injuries. Okay. Sergeant, to that point, I appreciate the effort that uh, your team has been making in terms of trying to educate pedestrians, but it's amazing that uh, even now there's a sizable portion of pedestrians that refuse to walk on the 
uh, side facing traffic, they actually glare at you if you're walking on the side facing traffic, <laughs> like as though you're like, you, you know, doing the wrong thing. I don't know what else can be done about it, but uh, maybe more signs, I don't know. But anyways, oh, no. we'll go on. Sorry, please. Was there uh, any other questions about the, about the reports? No. One of the things to note is that recently we uh, moved one of our other motorcycle officers. Uh, we, we adjusted his schedule a little bit, so he's working um, every other Saturday, and he and I have been going out and doing bicycle uh, enforcement, uh, specifically at the intersection of Atherton Avenue and Alameda de los Bogus. So you'll see an increase in numbers of uh, bicycle stops for the next couple months or so. What are you seeing up there primarily running the stop sign? It, it, that's, yeah, essentially running the stop sign is the, is the big one. Yeah. I'll go out there that's and sit, great. I'll go out there and sit out there on, on Saturdays. But when you get a group of, of, you know, eight or nine bicyclists that all go through the, the sign without stopping, it's hard to, corral them all up together. So at least I'll have somebody out there with me to, we can uh, start making some more stops. They do that at the uh, lights of uh, Middlefield and um, uh, Marsh, but it's not as common as uh, your area of Alameda de la Pulgas, but they just blow through the lights. Are they allowed to do that? No, no, they, they have to follow the same rules of the roads uh, as motor vehicles. The southbound bicyclists on uh, Middlefield at Marsh, they blow through the lights. Wait. Well, there's, that's a T intersection there. And as, long, as long as they're southbound on the, on the southbound shoulder, they, they, they can essentially go through there uninterrupted without any you know, cause of, of any you know, vehicles uh, having you know, uh, any hazard of any, being struck by any vehicles. I see. Okay. So that's legal for them. Right. There's no, I don't believe there's a limit line for the bicyclists. I think the bike lane uh, is uninterrupted in that area. That is correct. The bike lane is uninterrupted. It's just that when, you know, people are making a left turn onto middle field, it could be a little <laughs> dangerous, but I guess. No, I, I, I understand what you're saying completely. Uh, if we've done the staff reports, uh, uh, do we have any member of the public for public comment? I don't see any members of the public. Eh? And future agenda, do we have anything new right now? Otherwise, uh, can we uh, get a motion to adjourn? Carol, motion to adjourn. I'll second it. I will motion to adjourn. How's that? Sure. I'm okay. Good. Second, Christine. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Here. Meeting thank adjourned. You, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Good decision. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.